Carrie Bam, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we do appreciate you, Carrie. You always uh, bring such great talents and, and share us to, for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Uh, we're glad that you're here today with us, too, uh, to worship the Lord. And if you're visiting with us online as well, we're certainly glad to have you uh, part of this service of worship. I want to share with you some announcements. And while I do that, if you would, there's red pew pads on the end of each row. Uh, give us a registration of your attendance. Fill that out. Pass it down to your neighbors so everybody gets a chance to, uh, to fill that out. Right after our service today, uh, we have an all-church meeting. Shouldn't take very long. Uh, we need to let the state of Texas know that we've changed our name. And so uh, we have to approve the changes to our articles of incorporation uh, or, re or renew them, I think is what they're called. Uh, and so that meeting will take place right after the, uh, the service here. So hopefully you, if you can, if you're a member and want to stay, you can. If you're a guest and want to stay, you're welcome to do that too. Uh, but like I said, it shouldn't take very long uh, to get that taken care of. Uh, Club 118 happens today from 4 to 5.30. That's for our 4th, 5th, and 6th graders. And uh, that's going to be at the Wood House, right? So if you need to know where the Woods live, uh, Miss Deirdre is down front and center. She'll be glad to let you know uh, where that is. Also, her number is in the bulletin if you needed to give her a call. United Women in Faith, which is our women's group, is going to be meeting on Wednesday, February 1st at 10 a.m. in the parlor. So ladies of the church are invited to come and be a part of that. Potluck with a Purpose uh, is going to be on Wednesday, February the 8th uh, in the Family Life Center. Bring a food, bring something we can share with the Mission House too, a canned item. Uh, they sure would appreciate that. Mission Barrel for February. Uh, we're asking for blue jeans again. Normally we do this in the summer and we you know, call them blue jean Sundays and all that kind of good stuff. Well, they're low on certain uh, blue jeans. And so they're looking for sizes 29, 30, 32, and 34, new or gently used. So if you're out and about or have some, you know, going through your closet and you find some of these, I'm sure they'll take other sizes as well. Okay. Men, women's, children. Okay, men's little size jeans. Huh? <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. I used to wear those sizes. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so there's that. So please know about that. Next uh, Sunday uh, is uh, the youth are having a silent disco at Lane's Chapel in Tyler. If uh, silent disco, it's just really kind of neat. It's something that Lakeview does, and they will uh, send out their equipment to churches and things like that. Uh, what it is is the, the all the kids will have headphones on and there are three channels and uh, each channel is a different uh, uh, set of music that they play through those channels and, and you can tell in the room who's listening to what because there's the green channel the red channel I believe the blue channel and uh, everybody is dancing and if you don't have headphones on and you and you get in the room you look around it's the craziest thing in the world there are people just dancing you don't hear any music unless you have the headphones on so uh, it's actually a lot of fun. The kids love it. And so uh, our church is going in with Lane's Chapel and First Baptist, too. Is that right, Katie? Okay, maybe First Jacksonville is going to join us, too. So awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. They're going to be up at Lane's Chapel. All right. Any, uh, any other announcements that we need to make? Anything I missed? No? Let's uh, review our mission statement today, okay? We're trying to get this down and learn this together. Let's say this all at once. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ who worship passionately, love extravagantly, and witness boldly. Amen? Let's stand together and greet one another in the name of the Lord.
As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. Please remain standing for our call to worship. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. To God be the glory. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare our hearts for worship. Will you stand with me, please, as we sing God of grace and God of glory. seated for children's time. Good morning. Good morning. Come on down. So in Sunday school, we, we made this because I knew we were going to talk about it today. And um, it has some little bees on it. And the reason there's little bees on this is because all of these little bees have a little message on the back of them. And it's all of them are called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. So we talked about it a little bit in Sunday school, because, and I, I was telling the kids, y'all need to listen to Pastor David, because he's going to talk about this today. So I want y'all to pay attention. Pastor David's going to talk about the Beatitudes today. So I'm going to read off some of the Beatitudes. Beatitudes say, blessed are those who are peacemakers. What is a peacemaker? What does that mean? One who makes peace. Very good. So if if somebody is arguing 
and you kind of help them work it out, then you're a peacemaker. So Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. What is poor in spirit? Do you remember? We kind of talked about it a little bit. Sadness. So poor in spirit usually means something. someone is sad or maybe they're lonely. Maybe they're sick. Poor in spirit. What about those who mourn? Did y'all know that mourn is kind of a word we don't use all the time? You know what that means? Mourn means someone who is has lost something or someone. So one, one who is in mourning. But Jesus says those people are blessed. And Jesus says people who are sad are blessed. And Jesus says people who are peacemakers are blessed. And so what he's trying to teach us is that Whenever things happen in our lives, whether they're really great or not really great, or maybe we have opportunities to be a peacemaker, we have opportunities to lean towards Jesus, to draw on Jesus. When we're sad, when we're poor in spirit, we have an opportunity to draw closer to Jesus, to lean on Jesus. Because when we're sad or when we're in our lowest place, Sometimes that's the time that we realize how important Jesus is to us. So it's in a way, sad times are a blessing. So Jesus is trying to teach us to think about things in His in His way, in His through His eyes. Because when we do that, we draw closer to Him and we lean more on Him, and we actually really are blessed. That's good to know, isn't it? All right, let's pray. And if you're in fourth, fifth, or sixth grade, I would love you to come to Club 118 tonight. It's going to be at the Woods House. Okay, so We'll talk about that later. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us opportunity to draw, draw closer to you. Help us to be on the lookout to ways that we can be closer to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's pray. You can stay right there. This is a time in our service when we are going to recognize our fourth and seventh graders who are receiving Bibles at this time. So if you're one of our fourth and seventh graders, come on down. We had several of them in our early service already, and we had some that were unable to attend today. So we've got a couple of them here that are going to be with us and going to receive their Bibles today. Now, I think I mentioned this last time, but I'll, I'll repeat it just in case you didn't hear it. Uh, most churches give Bibles to third graders. It's about the time that they're really engaging in reading and, and, and wanting to know more from reading and from the Bibles and things like that. And so most churches give Bibles simply to third graders. We also give Bibles to seventh graders. And the purpose of that is uh, that children's Bible... Uh, is, is great for that age, but when they reach the age of 7th graders, they want something uh, that's a little more teen-oriented or something that's a little more attractive to them at that age, and we want them to continue in their scripture reading, continue in their Bible reading, and so we want to make sure they have a Bible that they will be uh, proud to take with them and to youth group and to, and to study on their, their own as well, and so we give both to the 4th graders and to the 7th uh, graders. Beardy? All right, so I picked out some, some Bibles that I feel like are going to be good for, for each of you for the age that you're, you're in. So, Shannon, your Bible has some really great pictures, and it has some descriptions of what the scriptures mean and some questions you can ask yourself, like this one says, how to pray. So I would love for you to spend time every day looking through that, even if it's just for a few minutes, and you can read it with your mom and dad or just by yourself, okay? And then for you, there's different... Passages, this is a teen study Bible, okay, because you're all getting all grown up now, and <laughs> there's different things that you can read about that apply to you and other kids your age. So I encourage you to read your Bible every night, even if just for a little bit, um, because it's a really good practice to get into, and it's going to strengthen your foundation in your faith and your relationship with Jesus. We have over 91 people who have signed up for our Reading Through the Bible in a Year and, uh, and now you have your own Bibles to, to begin reading in the Scriptures. And I challenge you, as a pastor, to just pick one chapter a day uh, to read before you, you go to bed and see what, what's in there. You might start with one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They're in the New Testament, the beginning of the New Testament. If you need to know where that is, 
talk to mom and dad, and they can make sure to help you find where that is, or you can use the glossary at the beginning. You know, some people are like, well, I'm supposed to know where this stuff is. And no, 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 there's a table of contents, not a glossary, a table of contents in there just for that purpose. So use it and learn where the Bible books are and get to know them and read through those. Um, we, uh, we believe that the Word of God is what we stand on. Uh, we believe that the Word of God contains all that is necessary for salvation. We believe that the Word of God uh, speaks to us as the rule of our faith. And, and where we where we put into practice. And so it is truth and all that it theologically proclaims. And so we hold this to be very important in our lives. And so we want to instill that uh, that honor and and that uh, that that nature of the word is is for us that it's not something we just read and forget, but rather it's something that we apply to our lives and read it on a regular basis. It's food for our souls. And so we want to instill that not only in our youth but also in you so that it becomes a daily habit of reading scripture, uh, whether you're doing it together with others like the Chronological uh, Bible Challenge or just reading on your own, that kind of uh, input in your daily life, your spiritual life is what is needed. And so at this time, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we say a prayer for these young readers. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks uh, for uh, these young readers, for, for Canon and Danica and, and the others, uh, Lord, who have received Bibles this day. Father, we pray that uh, as they read their Bibles, they would uh, see Jesus in there. Uh, they would learn about what it means to be a Christian. Uh, they would learn how to apply the truths of the scriptures to their lives so that they live lives that bring honor to you and put a smile on your face, Lord. Thank you for uh, uh, their willingness to learn and grow. And we pray, Father, that you would use the seeds that you plant now through your word, that they would blossom one day into a full faith that is, uh, that is fruitful uh, and that makes a difference in the world for the kingdom of God. And we pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as together we affirm our faith. This morning we're using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever. come to our time of prayer, we certainly want to remember those that uh, are, have been in the hospital and been recovering and, and rehabs and things like that. There are those that uh, we've been able to share through our email prayer list, and we do thank Catherine for keeping up with that. If, you, if you're interested, if you're not getting uh, prayer emails, uh, we certainly want to make sure that you do get those if you want to join us in prayer. Catherine, raise your hand. See Catherine after the service today. Share your email with her, and she'll put you on the prayer list so that we can uh, share the emails, those prayer emails with you. And you can know uh, how to pray for folks that are in, the, in this church and family members and so forth. So let's bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as we come before you this morning, uh, we are mindful of those who have been uh, dealing with illness and sickness, whether it be with heart and lung or kidney uh, or, or cancer or other things, Lord. We, our heart goes out to them and, and our concerns and prayers are with them. And, and when we say that our, our thoughts and prayers are with them, that is not shallow words to us. <clears throat> the world around us may want to make those words to mean nothing these days because they're just said too many times. But Lord, for us, they are very real and very true because we practice them. We pray when needs come forward. Uh, we, we are mindful of those that are in need, uh, and we don't uh, do that lightly, Lord. And so uh, may we be the people of prayer that you've called us to be, praying for those in need. 
Lord, lifting up the sick, the lonely, the lost, those that are in need of Christ. Father God, uh, we seek always to be your faithful disciples, and we don't always do that well. Uh, sometimes we, we fail you and fall short. We say things and, and do things that we regret. And for those times, O oh Lord, when we have fallen short of your glory, we ask for your forgiveness, Lord. And we pray that you would forgive us and heal us and break the chains that bind us and free us, Lord, for joyful obedience to your kingdom's work here on earth. Lord, we are mindful of that there are those who do not know you, who uh, are searching for you, searching for you even though they don't realize it. They're, they're looking for that thing that can fill the, the hole in their heart, and, and they may try to fill it with the bottle, or they may try to fill it with pills, or they may try to fill it with people, uh, or, or, or the world's understanding of success, but they have still they still feel an emptiness inside themselves, Lord, uh, when, when those sort of things don't add up for them. What they don't realize is the thing that, that, that fills that void in their heart is Jesus. And we pray, Father, that we might witness boldly to our faith in Jesus so that others may come to know that He is the one that fills their deepest need. He is the one that, that fills that hole in their hearts so that others can come to know the saving love of Jesus Christ that we have come to know, Lord. Uh, we, are, we are but yet a beggar who has found a place for food, and it's our job to go and tell the other beggars where the food can be found in Christ. So, Lord, help us to do that. Help us to be your witnesses and to witness boldly for Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you stand with me, please, as we sing the gift of love? Oh, I may speak with bravest fire and have a gift to all inspire and have not love. My words are vain as sounding brass and hopeless gain. Faithful Father, thank you for the gift of abundant and eternal life. You are a good Father who gives us great gifts, and your generosity always overflows. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the blessings that you have given to us. May our gifts be acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
Yes, we must have scripture this morning. <laughs> Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will call, be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God, you may be seated. Would you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Speak to us from your word. Open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds to see your truth and to live that out in our daily lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Happiness is an American right. We see that in America. We we see it that uh, we we see it right alongside in the Declaration of Independence, right alongside life and liberty. There is the pursuit of happiness, and we all know people who are who are living that out in their lives. They are pursuing happiness with everything that is within them. They are doing everything they can to try and be happy. They're pursuing it in all kinds of different ways, and sometimes the ways in which they pursue it are not necessarily the best kinds of ways. Uh, They're running around looking for the next amusement park ride. They're running around looking for the the next thrill. They're running around looking for the next drink or the next pill or the next person to make them happy. They're looking and pursuing happiness a happiness that often, if not always, eludes them. And it can be confusing to watch. One man buys a, two or three homes in hopes that, that having all those homes is going to make them happy. Uh, another one goes into the wilderness like a hermit to think that that's what it's going to take to make them happy. One woman becomes a nun in hopes of finding happiness. Another becomes a harlot. One young man thinks happiness is found in bodybuilding while Another one tries to destroy his body by doing drugs. One couple thinks happiness is found with children, and another couple thinks that happiness is found only when you don't have children. Malcolm Muckeridge, an English journalist and satirist, once called the pursuit of happiness the most disastrous prosper, or the most dra- disastrous purpose set before humanity. Something slipped in the Declaration of Independence after life and liberty at the last moment, almost if by accident. He writes, happiness is like a young deer, fleet and beautiful. Hunt him and he becomes a poor, uh, frantic quarry and after the kill, just a piece of stinking flesh. That's pretty powerful. How many of y'all have ever read or heard about the screw tape letters? Raise your hand. Some of y'all have a book written by uh, allegorical book written by uh, C.S. Lewis uh, in which he tells the story of a senior demon writing to a to a junior demon screw tape the senior demon writing to Wormwood the junior demon on how to tempt human beings. It's a fascinating read. It's it's uh, not very long if you're interested in it. it deals with all kinds of temptations and things that uh, that uh, uh, the enemy puts in our path to try to tempt us and and all that. And in particular, when speaking about happiness, this is what he says. Screw tape says to Wormwood, he says, "Happiness is an ever increasing craving for an ever diminishing pleasure." Now think about that for a minute. The pursuit of happiness, this running around looking for that thing, that something that's going to make us happy, is an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure. In James Houston's book, In Pursuit of Happiness, a woman named Gloria describes her pursuit of happiness as being stuck at an amusement park. 
Many times I have felt as if I am trapped on a huge roller coaster, she writes, that goes up and down and round and round. Sometimes I manage to escape and get off the mad ride, but I'm still in the amusement park. Outside the park, the world looks exciting, but it's too risky. I am sure that I could survive out there. I'm not sure I could survive out there. So the amusement park remains still the biggest attraction in my life. For everyone is being persuaded to stay inside the gates of the amusement park and get back on the roller coasters. Yet I still think of people in the past who have gone outside the park. They are the ones who truly seek God with all their heart, mind, and soul, and body, and are fully prepared to give it all up. They are the ones who live uncompromising lives, who don't feel the grip of money, the pressure of society, the weakened desire for goodness, the punctured self-discipline, the crushing fear of the future, the horror of death, the threat of injustice, the need for security, the rule of self. They don't struggle for faith, hope, and love. They pour out from them. Faith, hope, and love pour out from them and through them. It is these people outside of the amusement park who seem to be totally free. And me? I'm not happy. I wish I could live outside of the amusement park. I wish I had the stuff to do it, but I'm afraid at the center I am empty. Now we all know people who are living life in the amusement park. They're, they're running around looking for the next thrill. They're running around looking for the next relationship. They're running around looking for the next drink. They're running around looking for the next pill. Whatever it may be, that thing that is going to make them happy. And it always seems to be sand that just flows through their fingers and they can't get a grasp on it they may get off the roller coaster long enough to gaze at the gates at real life outside but without the courage to go there and as soon as the roller coaster of life stops they then go and find the next roller coaster to please them that's a a painful way of living life but it is a way that many people we know and maybe some here are living. This is why we can appreciate the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Nine different times Jesus uses the word blessed, which is roughly translated as happy. But it's a different kind of happiness that Jesus is talking about. It, it probably is better described as blessed or maybe even better described as joyful. The core values Jesus offers in the Beatitudes describes a life that is worth living, which is, in other words, life outside of the amusement park. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, Jesus described nine characteristics of a truly happy Christian life. And if you want to know what true happiness is all about, then you need to study this manifesto of happiness that comes from, from Jesus. And as you study it, you'll discover the truths that become clear. And the first truth I want to point out to you is this, that the pursuit of true happiness is part of God's purpose for you and me. Once again, I turn to C.S. Lewis, who uh, enjoyed uh, telling the story of a young child. He asked one day what he thought God was like. And as far as the child could make out, God was always the one snooping around to see if anyone was enjoying himself so that he could put a stop to it. Have you ever known anybody like that? who thinks that God is just this policeman up there with his radar gun trying to see when you sin so that he can give you a ticket and squash out any kind of joy that might be in your life. There are Christians who act that way. They believe if you're not sad, you're not holy. They have a long-faced religion, and they are easy to judge and make critical comments and negative comments about those around them. Yet God's purpose is not a joyless existence. God's purpose is a joyful existence. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, I have come, this is Jesus speaking, I have come all the way down here to this earth, not so you can have long-faced religion, not so that you can have this joyless, ho-hum kind of a lifestyle. Rather, I have come that you may have what? Life. And have it how? To the full. 
Jesus comes to give us life. In other translations, it says, I have come that you might have abundant life. Not a dreary life, not a negative life, not a, not a joyless kind of a life. He's come that we might have the blessed life. It's part of God's purpose for us. Anyone who sees Jesus in any other light than this is missing the point of why Jesus came. When you read about Jesus, you discover that he's very winsome. He was the person that liked to go to weddings and to, 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 to go to, to gatherings of people with friends and food and wine and have a good time with others. This was the person who, who invited children. Children naturally flocked to him. And, and he said, do not hinder them. Do not stop them from coming. For such belongs the, 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 king, to the kingdom of God. Do these children belong? Jesus was a winsome person. He was the one that enjoyed mingling, not only with the religious elites, but also the sinners as well. And he had a sense of humor, too. If you looked at the Gospels and you see some of the, the ways Jesus talked in parables, you can see, imagine that there might be a chuckle or two going on at the crowd that was listening to him. I mean, that whole thing about the, the speck in your eye and the log in their eye, or the speck in your eye, their, their eye and the log in your you know what I'm talking about. That had to bring up a chuckle from them. I mean, lo and behold, that's a very funny kind of, a, of a, an idea or concept. The people who try to paint a picture as Jesus as someone who's sad or morbid have missed the picture of who Jesus is and why he came. Jesus delighted in life, and he wants us to delight in life as well. And he gave us the Beatitudes to tell us and to teach us how to do it. God's desire is that his children radiate joy so contagious that it can't be held in and so that it spills over into the lives of those around them. That's the first thing I want you to know. Here's the second thing I want you to know. The second thing is this. The journey to true happiness is a journey inward. It's an inward journey moving down into our soul. Those who are truly happy will will fit the, what the criteria Christ says in Matthew chapter 5. And a quick scan of this, this chapter reveals thoughts that run contrary to the world's definition and the world's understanding of what happiness is all about. There's not a single reference in there to health. There's not a single reference in there to work. There's not a single reference in there to income or finances or security or homes or love or even friends. Christ knew that while these things often accompany happiness, they do not produce it. Let me say that again. Christ knew that while these things often accompany happiness, and they do, we have happiness when we're around our friends and there's joy from that, yes, but, but they do not produce it on their own. Jesus' list completely reversed the standards of the world. He writes, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are meek those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful, those who are pure in heart, that are peacemakers, and those who are persecuted because of righteousness? Doesn't that sound like an odd list of things to do in order to live a life of blessedness, joy, and even happiness, true happiness? Well, I turn to Eugene Peterson to help us out here. Has anyone read from the message uh, uh, paraphrase of the Bible? It's a paraphrase that came out a number of years ago before Eugene Peterson passed away. And, and it's a wonderful paraphrase because he puts the Bible in, in language that's very easy to, to, uh, to understand. And he stays true to the word, but he, he, he takes some liberty at using additional wording to kind of describe what is going on there. And I want to I read to you now the, 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 the attitudes, but written from Eugene Peterson's perspective. And I think they will help us to understand what Jesus is talking about a little bit better. Listen to this. Verse 3 says this. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God in his rule. Verse 4. You are blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Remember Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Because only then can you be embraced by the one most dear dear to you verse 5 you are blessed when you're content with just who you are no more no less 
Because that's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. Verse 6. You are blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's the way Jesus said it. But this is a great way to describe that. You've worked up a a, a righteous appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment you're being careful, you find yourself cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, in other words, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when you when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. And I would add even deeper into trusting God in the midst of it all. Isn't that great? Doesn't that help to kind of unpack that just a a little bit more to understand what, what Jesus was talking about? And can't you see how contradictory these are to the ways the world describes as what is necessary for the pursuit of happiness? This goes against the world's standards. It goes against the world's wisdom. They are saying no person can hear without shock and amazement. And they are paradoxes that Jesus used to destroy the foolish illusion that many of his followers and many people today seek after when they are seeking the happiness that they know or think they know. Jesus' followers wanted prosperity, and they wanted control, and Jesus spoke instead of poverty and sorrow, cutting straight to the heart of what was needed in their lives. Let's look at number three. The third thing that, uh, that uh, we learn from the Beatitudes is that the pursuit of true happiness is not a goal, but rather a byproduct. The pursuit of happiness is not our goal, as it is for so many in the world. But for us as Christians, the pursuit of happiness is not the goal, but rather the byproduct. People who start out, start off with the purpose of becoming happy, only rarely arrive at that happy place. Happiness sought for its own sake is usually self-defeating. There's a fellow who said this quote that I'm going to share with you. He said, I think... I must be the happiest man in the world. I have never met anyone who has had as much fun as I have had. Now, what kind of person do you think said that? Was it maybe a a famous entertainer who's who's got it all and lives in Hollywood and is in movies? You think a movie star said that? Or, Or what about a rock star, you know, someone who's lived the wild life and they've done whatever they want? Do you think they are the ones that said that? What about someone who who uh, 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 is, is uh, uh, living up life in Partyville, you know? They party all the time. Everything's a, a grand scheme, you know? Drink all you can, eat all you can, gluttony all you can. Is that the kind of person that said that right there? Well, let me tell you who said that quote right there. Because it wasn't a Hollywood elite. It wasn't a, a socialite. It wasn't a rock star. It wasn't a, 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 a social media influencer. And, and it wasn't the party person. This quote was said by a name... A man named Frank LeBlanc. And Frank LeBlanc is a Christian missionary. And in his adventures of life, of being a Christian missionary, he dedicated his life's work to cultivating literacy in third world countries. And he has the joy of going around and teaching people who might otherwise never learn how to read. And he finds such great joy and great pleasure when he sees the light bulb goes off in their minds. When these people discover, wow, I can read this short little sentence. And if I can read this short little sentence, that means I can learn to read paragraphs. And that means I can learn to read books. And then that means I can learn to read my Bible. And that joy that is in their hearts becomes something that pours out. This is a man who has come to know joy and blessedness and happiness. And it's not because he was pursuing it. It was because he was pursuing something greater and more important in life. 
being the person God has called him to be and doing the things God has called him to do. True joy is the byproduct and not the goal. Here's the final thing I want to say to you this morning. We'll conclude with this. The pursuit of true happiness ultimately will lead you to Jesus. The pursuit of true happiness will lead you ultimately to Jesus. The fifth chapter of Matthew's rec- records the words of Jesus regarding true happiness. And Jesus, as we know, was an extremely happy person. I and mean, if you look at how he interacted with people, if you looked at, at uh, what he did in life, he went to weddings and, and turned water into wine. He, he, had, he had gatherings with, with friends and, and foes. He, 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 I, I picture Jesus as one who enjoyed a good laugh especially with all the unusual kind of imageries that he would use, logs and all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, There's a picture of Jesus, and and I wish I had prepared this in advance, and I didn't do it, but it's a picture called the picture of the laughing Jesus. Have you all ever seen this? It's an artist rendition of Jesus. And and, and, and and when we think of an artist rendition of Jesus, what do we think of? Well, we think of the Caucasian Jesus that is in most churches, and he's sitting here like this. He's very white. He's got long hair. You've seen it. We've had it in our churches, probably somewhere around. Uh, and most churches have had it. But G- those Jesuses are always kind of quiet and, you know, hmm. and, and, or, or maybe you've seen other pictures of Jesus praying. And the, no, no, no. This picture that this artist did of Jesus is one where Jesus' head is back and his mouth is open and he is laughing with joy. Why? Because he has come to bring life and life abundant. And I believe Jesus is joyful. And I believe Jesus wants to instill joyfulness in us. A joyfulness that's not dependent on circumstances. is not dependent on what's going on in our life. If you look at the Beatitudes, they're not dependent upon circumstances. It is a joy that is us in us because Christ resides in us. This is the true happiness that Jesus wants to instill in every one of us. Even at the end, when Jesus was, was, uh, was, was with very few friends left, the 12 meeting in the upper room, everyone else seems to have gone a different way or, or, or cried out for him to be crucified or, or other things and is left. He was with his 12, and even knowing that he was going to the cross, even knowing he was going to, to experience the most cru- excruciatingly painful death that a person at that day and age could experience, He said these words to his disciples. He said, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be what? Full. Folks, may we live blessed lives. Doesn't mean we're not going to mourn. We can still know joy even in mourning. Doesn't mean we're not going to be persecuted. We can still know what it is to be blessed even when we're persecuted. God's great gift to us is this gift of the blessed life. We all know somebody on the roller coasters. Maybe we're occasionally running back to that theme park and looking for a roller coaster. May we help others discover life outside the amusement park. And may we live in that life of fullness in Christ. Amen? Amen. This time, uh, we're going to be singing our closing song. If you're here this morning, God is moving your heart and life, and you're ready to publicly profess your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been on those roller coasters way too long, and you're ready to get off, and you're ready to find true happiness and true joy in Jesus. We invite you to come forward. Let us pray with you to receive Christ and, and celebrate this day with you. If you have already uh, made that decision and maybe you've been part of this church for a little while now and, and you're ready to take membership seriously, uh, I invite you to, uh, to come and, and, and speak to me after the service or speak to me, I should say, later on this week. Uh, and let's set up a time where we can talk to you about uh, what membership is all about, share with you a mission and vision of the church. I met with uh, a couple named the Hills, uh, Mike and Susan Hill, this morning during Sunday school, and they joined our church uh, during the Sunday school hour. You, you can join by coming forward if you want, or you can join uh, privately as well. That, that we don't keep you from doing that. We don't want, uh, uh, you know, not everybody's comfortable being up in front of a congregation. So uh, 
uh, you know, people come as they feel led. Uh, at this time, I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. <laughs> now this benediction go forth as blessed people whose blessings pour out from them into the hearts and lives of others so that others may come to know the source of the true happiness in Jesus Christ amen, amen. stay around if you're a member we won't take long everybody else if you need to slip out you go right ahead or if you got dinner plans I won't, I won't fuss at you alright Thank you.